Well, I was very privileged to uh, be part of the early civil rights movement in my hometown of Dallas, Texas. I, I became exposed to the realities of that through my progressive Methodist church connections as a student uh, there in Dallas at Southern Methodist University. And um, uh, we became uh, involved just as the sit-ins were starting in the South in 1960, they just swept through the South and no sooner did, did students all over hear about it than they began to do it. And we began to do it in Dallas and we did get those colored signs taken down forthwith, I'm happy to say. I think it was mainly the economics of it, the, the um, power structure, business oriented power people of Dallas did not want the same thing that was happening in Birmingham and other southern cities to happen in Dallas. So a little bit of nudging in that direction uh, from us and others and mainly the headlines in the papers that at that period resulted in the in this segregation ending. Um, <clears throat> it took a little while longer in the schools. I was involved in desegregation of Dallas Public Schools, worked for the federal judge that issued the order. And so um, I was mainly involved in that, but began to learn more about Vietnam later, after I, I was no longer a student. I was a young teacher. <clears throat> I was actually blackballed from teaching in Dallas Public Schools because I had gone to some black schools to substitute teach. Not, not knowing then uh, that they had their list of teachers and the white schools had their list of teachers. I knew that uh, there weren't many white teachers teaching in black schools, but I didn't know it was a definite policy. I guess I should have. And um, so that was reported to the superintendent of schools and I was blackballed from teaching in Dallas, I learned later. But I got a better job than that because after a little while I was working for the, directly for the federal court on a committee set up to oversee the school desegregation order. So I was doing that, minding my own business, uh, but very much had become opposed to the Vietnam War uh, when the Christmas bombing of North Vietnam occurred, which was December of 72. And that was right after the 72 election when Nixon had promised peace in Vietnam. And as soon as he was reelected in November, they just hauled off and, and hit. And uh, there was that iconic picture of the little girl running down the road on fire, having been burned from mm -hmm. that bombing. And it just, it just tore what I sort of felt like was saran wrap <laughs> around me um, about the Vietnam War. I, I opposed it in theory, but it, it really reached through to my, to my senses and my heart and passion and um, I said to the minister of my Methodist church, I don't know who the peace people are or where one finds them, but I've got to go to Washington and protest against this. So I did and I marched behind Phil and later he came to Dallas for something having to do with Chile that a friend insisted I come to. Didn't know much about, Latin, didn't know anything about Latin America really and so I saw him there and I went up and said, I don't know your name, but I marched behind you to the White House last month. And so that's how we met. And then we proceeded from there. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it was obviously a great match because uh, both of you had already been involved in many struggles for justice and civil rights and so forth, and then just uh, joined forces. Uh, that's you know, right. <laughs> and uh, supporting and encouraging and helping one another in the struggle. Now, Sue, I know you're from Dallas, and um, I believe you mentioned once that you were present there in the crowds of people who were there to see and uh, support President Kennedy when he visited Dallas. Uh, I was wondering if you could just tell us what would have, been, would have been some reasons why people in high office in the U.S. government might have wanted to get rid of Kennedy. So aside from going into the facts, which are very covered up and very difficult to sort out, but why do some people think that 
there were people in high positions in the U.S. government who could have done that and who, who probably did it. But what would have been some of the reasons? Well, Kennedy was roundly hated by uh, certain powers that be. And I, I was called a communist by my sorority sisters at SMU for having voted for Kennedy. The day uh, he visited Dallas, uh, the day he was shot, there was a full-page ad in the Dallas Morning News. Black, black border, his picture, said, wanted for treason, John F. Kennedy. And so the hatred was palpable. The reasons, um, Kennedy had advanced re uh, desegregation. I think the main reason had to do with U.S. foreign policy. Uh, certainly uh, the forces that I believe did kill Kennedy, and I think it was headed, uh, I think the, the onus is on the CIA for, for that, the highest levels. Uh, and there is evidence of that, was that he, they wanted to overthrow the Castro re regime. And when Kennedy did not uh, go along with that after the Bay of, uh, in the Bay of Pigs, withdrew U.S. air support, and then later, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they wanted to use that Cuban Missile Crisis, which was in October of 62, the year before he was killed, um, to bomb the hell out of Cuba. And, and destroy that regime. And the Kennedys stopped that. A great, they, if you watch the movie 13 Days, which is based on the transcripts inside the White House, inside the Oval Office and the conference room where they were all meeting during that time, you will see those forces coming on very strong against Bob, uh, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and their chief of staff. It was almost the three of those up against the whole power structure, especially of the military. It was led by extreme right-wing uh, General Curtis LeMay, I believe, was still in on that, who had led the bombing, saturation bombing of uh, during World War II. Um, Johnson was in on that. They wanted to go full, full bore on Vietnam. Kennedy was starting to give some indication that he did not want to go full bore on Vietnam. So it was Cuba is, is uh, exemplified in that movie uh, the Cuban, about the Cuban Missile Crisis, 13 days. But it was also, he had given a, written an executive order ordering tri troops out of Vietnam, just a few. But he, and they were trainers at, at that time, but he was getting them home and he had said that if he was reelected in 64, he would get out of Vietnam. Douglas talks in there about the um, Bobby Kennedy saying to somebody who reported it uh, after John Kennedy's death that they were very opposed to what was going on in Vietnam and Bobby Kennedy slammed his, his hand on the table and said, we were there, we saw, we talked to the Vietnamese. This was, of course, before John had been elected president. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, they were seeing the world differently. They were seeing Vietnam differently. They were thinking for themselves. They were not following the script. Uh, and uh, John Kennedy was, was being the leader that you would hope a president would be, and not just following along with the established ground and established modus operandi. And for that, he was roundly hated by the power structure. So he was questioning a lot of it, major things, mm -hmm. and 
um, he was stopped in his tracks, of course. The first thing Johnson did right after Kennedy was killed on that Monday morning, he signed another executive order reversing Kennedy's executive order and ordering more trip, mm -hmm. troops to Vietnam. And of course the big buildup began at, at that point. So I think that's mm -hmm. why. So Kennedy and his people were basically interested in diplomacy and we could say barg bargaining and negotiating with the so-called enemy rather than taking a militaristic and uh, blow them off the face of the earth right. approach. And that's what got him into so much trouble. And that's what saved the world mm -hmm. from nuclear catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, when you watch that movie, you say, as I did, thank you, John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. 